so we just want to continue with um, our 2602. Then we are going to look at unit number two, which has to do with the goods market. So this is basically about the goods market. So if you don't have an idea um, what the goods market is, I'll just quickly give you a recap of what the goods market has to do with. Remember in microeconomics, you learned about the interaction of households and firms. Those are the two main participants in the economy, households and firms. Right, so I'm just gonna quickly draw something here. These are the two main participants in the economy. Right? You've got firms and households. So these two, they interact through markets, is it? That is how they interact, households and firms. So there are two main markets in which they interact. The first one is the goods market. market. And then the second one is a factors market. I'm sure by now all of you, you understand what you mean by a market. I don't know, what do you understand? What's a market? Let me ask Zanelli, what's a market? Um, a market is a place where people exchange uh, uh, goods for cash or cash for services. So it's mm -hmm. where there's buying and selling of products. Excellent, yes. So that is basically what you mean by saying a market. A market, it's, um, it is something, it can be a physical place, it can be a physical place, or it can be a virtual place. So it's any arrangement. Right? A market is in any arrangement that facilitates trading. Right? So when we say trading, we mean buying and selling of, of something. That is a market. Right? So I think that in the economy, we've got these two major participants. Of course, they are not only firms and households, we've got also government. If you watch the previous video, I think I also talked about uh, households, uh, firms, government, uh, monetary sector together with the foreign sector. Right? There are basically five of them, five market participants. Right? Then, but we're mainly concerned in this case, the interaction of these two major ones, households and firms. Right? So they interact through markets there are two markets in which they can interact the first one is called a goods market and then the second one is a factors market so i'm sure that you're quite familiar with this from ECA 1601 that's where you actually studied a lot about this so this is more like a recap right so what happens in the goods market firms this is the productive sector of the economy. That is where production takes place. Right. So firms, they're going to produce goods and services. And when they do that, they're going to supply that into the factors market, I mean, into the goods market. Right. So we've got firms supplying the goods and, and services into the goods market. And then from the goods market, those goods and services, they are going to go to the households. So we've got goods and services. Right. So you see the direction of my arrows. Remember arrows, uh, they basically show the direction. So we've got goods and services coming from 
the firms, which is the productive sector of the economy, right, going to households, but they go to households via the goods market. So at the same time, is households are receiving these goods and services. Right? Obviously, they have to pay for them. So you've got money going to firms via the goods market. So you've got another arrow that is coming from households to the firms. Right? So from the perspective of households, when they take money out of them, that is spending. Because money is coming from them, so we call it spending. And then from the goods market, firms they are receiving this money is it all, or some kind of income. To them, since they are receiving, we just call it income. Right. So that is the interaction between these two in the goods market. Right? Firms. They supply goods and services to households. Households they buy through spending, then firms they receive through income. So in the goods market, who are buyers and who are sellers? Let me hear from Jade, what do you think? In the goods market, who are buying goods and services and who are selling these goods and services so the sellers would be the firms yes and then the buyers would be the households yes exactly the symbol is that so remember that in the goods market firms are sellers households are buyers because that's what happens in a market in a market you've got buyers and sellers it doesn't matter what kind of a market it is so as long as it's a market you've got buyers and sellers so in the goods market we have got firms who are sellers, households who are buyers. Right. So this goods market, it is sometimes called the real sector of the economy. So this sometimes called the real sector of the economy. Why do you, what do you think? Why is it called a real sector of the economy? Why are we calling this goods market a real sector? Uh, can can I take a chance at yes. that? Um, yes. Perhaps it's perhaps it's called a real sector where there's physical exchange of of of, of the items being sold. Exactly. Um, yes. And the receipt of uh, funds or money. Yes. Exactly. That's it, Jade, exactly. So that's why it's a real sector, because it involves the flow of real things, goods and services. Right. And also, make sure you, you see the direction, is it? The arrows, they always oppose. Like, if households are getting goods and services, then they have to pay something for that. So the arrows, they always oppose. Right? And then, they also interact through another market, and this market now, we call it the factors market. In the factors market, this is where there is buying and selling of factors of production. Factors of production such as what? Can you quickly recall the factors of production? Land, this one. Which is labor, land. Yes. Capital. Yes, capital and. Is it entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship. So all these factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, right? They are sold in the factors market. That's why it's called the factors market. Right? And who owns the factors of production? Who are the owners of them? Yes, Jade? Would that be the, house, that be the household? Yes, exactly. 
So since they are the owners, they can supply this speaker reproduction. To the goods market, I mean to the factors market, then it has to go to fence. So firms, they are receiving the factors of production. And then obviously, if firms get something, they have to take money out. Right? Then that money, it has to go to households because they are actually uh, supplying the factors of production. Right? Then from the perspective of firms, when they take money out, we call it spending. And when households receives that money, to them it becomes income. So in the factors market, who are buyers and who are sellers? The sellers would be the households yes. and then the buyers would be the firms. Yes. So that's it. So anyway, it was more like a recap. Right. But in this particular unit now, we are not concerned about the factors market. You want to look at the real sector of the economy, which is the goods market. That is the core subject of this particular unit. Right. So that means um, there's going to be a demand for the goods and services. Right. Who creates the demand? Or who demands? Who demands? Uh, would, that be the would that be the consumer? Yes. So the yes. households? Yes, exactly. So households or consumers, exactly, they demand the goods and services, right? But are they the only one who demands these goods and services? Who else demands them? Um, would, it, would, it, would, would the firms be included in the calculation for demand? Yes, yes, to some extent. They are included to some extent. Yes, that is very true. They're going to demand these goods and services. Yes, that is very true. Not to some extent, but actually it's very true. Firms, they also demand those goods and services. But who else? Even the foreign sector. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, the... The foreign sectors, exactly. international, foreign yeah, yeah. Exactly. They also demand, right? So in this case, when you look at that demand, uh, I mean the goods market, right? We are no longer talking about a single market, because remember this model is macroeconomics. So that means you are looking at the total demand of the goods and services. We are moving away from talking about only individuals, is it just consumers only? But rather, we are looking at the total demand in the economy. Right. So this gives rise to what is called the total demand. It's represented by capital letter Z. Right. So whenever you see Z in economics, especially in macro, Z represents total demand for the goods. And who demands that or those goods? The first part here, these are households. through consumption. So in the goods, in the total demand identity, uh, Z is equals to C plus I plus G plus X minus M, uh, or IM depending on which text that you're reading. Right? C is the demand that is coming from households. So we call this 
consumption expenditure. And that comes from households. Then we also have got another demand represented by I. What kind of demand is this? Jay, do you have actually is it mentioned investment? It? Yes, exactly. It's investment. So who demands that? So would the firms demand the investment? Yes, exactly. They are firms. They're the ones who indulge in investment expenditure. Right. So when you say investment here, yeah, we're going to look, of course, at each particular uh, variable in detail. Right. So obviously, firms, they demand goods that they're going to use during the production process. Because earlier on, we have identified that firms, this is the productive sector of the economy. Right. So they also demand goods and services so that they can produce other goods and services which can be sold to, to consumers. What about G? This is demand from who? From the government. Yes, this is from the government. For government expenditure. So G represents government expenditure, I investment expenditure, C consumption expenditure. Right. What about X? What does it represent? Uh was sorry was it imports uh, is it imports or exports <laughs> yeah i also get confused between the two but i think it's exports <laughs> yes exactly think about the x from exports but taking i always x. get confused there. Yes. and then <laughs> yeah. obviously m is from imports You see the difference. Okay. So this demand in terms of exports, who is demanding? The foreign sector. The foreign sector. Exactly. They demand the domestically produced goods. Right. What about imports? Who is demanding these imports? So that would be, for example, like South Africa. So the uh, consumers in that local country. Yes, in the domestic economy. Isn't it? That's right. So that is demand. Right. So when you look at this, um, this uh, goods demand uh, identity, there are certain assumptions which are made when you consider the goods market. We talk about what are called endogenous variables and exogenous variables. An endogenous variable, this is a variable that depends on other variables within the model. That is an endogenous variable. Right? Then what you're calling now an exogenous variable, this is a variable that are, or variables rather, that are not explained within the model. So this is some bit of terminology, but make sure you know the difference endogenous variable and exogenous variable. What does endogenous mean? Variables that depend on other variables within the model. It's going to become clear when I explain those different components of total demand. It becomes clear what we mean by saying endogenous variable and exogenous variable. So don't worry, it's just going to become clear very soon. So for now, know that when you look at an endogenous variable, you're looking at a variable that depends on other variables within the model. Remember, we have just formulated a model for total demand, isn't it? We say total demand, Z, is equal to C plus I plus G plus net exports. That is a model, and of course, this is a mathematical model that represents the total demand in the goods market. Right? So total demand in the goods market is given by C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So I want you to understand this, guys. These things that we are writing here, Z, C, I, 
g, x, and m. These are simply called variables. What a, what's a variable? Something that constantly changes subject to external factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about Zanil? What do you think? What's a variable? I think if you were there on um, 2601, was it yesterday? I did also explain what a variable is. What's a variable? That there's nothing wrong uh, that day, they said it's very correct, but I just want to hear from you, Zanil, your own, your own words. What's a variable? <laughs> um. I'd say it's um it's a component of I'm not sure how to put it, but it's it's a component that mm -hmm. a component of an equation. Okay, say it. okay, okay, okay. Let me not cut you. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not sure how to explain it. All right. All right, but I would say the component on, uh, oh, that makes up an equation. All right, yes, it's, it's a component, it's very true. As you can see, this is an equation, a left-hand side and the right-hand side, of course, with an equal sign, so that is an equation, yeah? Right. So just like what Jay said, when you look at a variable, just think about the, the word itself, what it means. Variable, it's coming from vary, so to vary, it means to change. That is what to vary means, it's just to change. So when it's a variable, we are looking at a quantity which can change. It's a physical, it can be a quantity that is measurable most of the times. Any quantity that you can measure and it doesn't stay the same, it can change. So there are so many variables that you have learned about in economics. Can you give me examples apart from the ones that you have written here? Consumption, investment, expenditure, government, expenditure, net exports, income. Can you give me other examples of variables that you've learned about in economics? Interest rate, it's a variable because it can change, right? Inflation, inflation rate, it's, it's, it's a variable. Right. What else? I've just given you two. What are the quantities? We're talking about quantities that you can measure and they can change from time to time. What are the variables in economics? Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, I don't know. For, for, for me, the, the inflation covers quite a lot, but mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, in this module whether fuel is, is considered a variable. When you say few, what do you mean? Uh, I'm, I'm referring to uh, um, the price of petrol, the price yes. of fuel. Yes, exactly. So you see, Jaden, Jade, sorry, I call it Jaden, don't worry. Right. So you have mentioned the variable thing. You said price. So price, that is a variable. Why are we saying that? Because price of goods and services can change. So price is a variable in economics. And also quantity, right? Quantity demanded is a variable. Quantity supplied is also another variable, right? So when you just talk about a variable, we're looking at any quantity that can change. That's a variable, right? So in this particular model, right, this is a goods market model yeah, that you formulated in the form of an equation, right? So the demand, which is a variable, demand can change, is it? It's a variable. How do you get the demand? It is equal to? It has got these components, is it? Demand is made up of consumption, expenditure, it's a variable. Investment, expenditure, it's a variable because it can change. Government expenditure, it's a variable. Net exports is also a variable. So when you look at an endogenous variable, let's look at the way here. An endogenous variable is a variable that depends on other variables within the so we have formulated a model here. That's a model. So if, for example, if consumption 
depends on Z. Then consumption is an endogenous variable. If investment depends on Z, because Z is also part of this model that you formulated. So if I depends somehow on Z, then I is an endogenous variable. If G is also dependent on Z somehow, then that makes G an endogenous variable. As simple as that is it. So an endogenous variable is a variable that depends on other variables within the model. So if you are defining this model here, if this one depends on that or that or that, then that makes this one endogenous variable. The opposite is also true. When you look at an, an exogenous variable, it's a variable that is not explained within the model. For example, if C depends on something else that is not part of this equation, then C is an exogenous variable. The same applies with G. If G is dependent on something else which we cannot feature here in this particular model, that makes G an exogenous variable. Right. So when you consider the goods market equation here, we want to look at each component you want to see whether it is an exogenous variable or an endogenous variable. So we are going to do that shortly. And of course, um, if you look at the difference between this identity here and this other one, this is the total demand for an open economy because it has got exports and imports. But if you consider a, an economy in isolation, if you ignore the foreign sector, then this Z changes to this. It's got only three components, C plus I plus G. It doesn't have exports and imports. Right? So I'm sure that part should be relatively straightforward. Right. So let's analyze now each component of total demand, is it? We want to start by looking at C. We want to see whether it's an exogenous variable or an endogenous variable. And then after that, we want to see if you're able to represent it on a diagram. So we want to start by looking at the consumption. Consumption uh, expenditure C is represented by this equation. CO plus C1 times YD. I'm sure that uh, all of you, you actually know some components of this because you've already covered that aspect in other economics models. So see, this is called the consumption function. If ever they ask you to write down the consumption function, remember a function, it's an equation. It has to have an equal sign. So the consumption function, C, is given by CO plus C1 times YD. So this consumption function, it is sometimes called a behavioral function. Why are we saying that it's a behavioral function? It is because it captures the behavior of households or consumers. So that's why sometimes it's called a behavioral function, because we're trying to describe how consumers behave in the goods market in terms of the, the demand of the goods and services. Right. So obviously, if it's a function or an equation, remember an equation has got different parts. It has got variables. Right? It has got what are called parameters. And of course, operators we will not look at operators because this is not a math module. There are two variables in this uh, equation or in this function. Consumption is a variable because it can change. YD is a variable because it can, it can change. Right? So we want to look at what each one represent. So we have identified that these are variables. What about C0 and C1? What are they? We have identified this and that to be variables.
what about uh, C1 and C0? These are code parameters. Parameters or constants. It is just the opposite of a variable. If something is variable, it means it can change. If something, can, if, if it cannot change, then we call it a constant. Or to, I mean, to just put some sugar into it to confuse people, and then you can just choose to call it a parameter. So a parameter is the same as a constant. It means it's something that is not changing. Right. So I'm sure you can see the difference between a variable and a parameter. So any equation, it has got these two components. It can have variables and parameters. It has to have these two. So a consumption function has got two variables, consumption itself and YD, which is called disposable income. We're going to look at it. It's called a disposable income. So firstly, let's start by looking at these two parameters. They have got special names, right? Just like in terms of variables, you have given names. This is a consumption. This is disposable income, right? These are variables. In terms of parameters, each one has got a special name. What do we call CO? CO is the intercept of the consumption function. We're going to look at it uh, for those who don't have a good math background. I'll show you uh, shortly what exactly are they uh, graphically. So CO is the intercept of the consumption function. Sometimes it is called the autonomous consumption. So when you say autonomous consumption, we mean we are looking at that part of consumption which does not depend on, on income. That is autonomous consumption. So CO is a parameter, but this parameter is called a autonomous consumption, or if you want, you can call it the consumption function intercept, depending on which one you prefer. And then C1, this is called a marginal propensity to consume. So I'm sure that sounds very familiar to you. It's a marginal propensity to consume. Sometimes it's abbreviated as MPC. So the marginal propensity to consume, this basically represents the fraction of consumers' incomes that they are going to spend through consumption. That is the marginal propensity to, to consume. It represents the fraction or the percentage of the total income that consumers are going to spend on consumption. Right. And then um, YD, like I said, this represents the disposable income. So you see, it's capital letter Y in the subscript D. This subscript D simply means disposable. So I'm looking at disposable income. So what's a disposable income? We are looking at the leftover income after you pay your tax. That is disposable income. It's the leftover income after paying your tax. So the disposable income, YD, it's the income, the actual amount that you are, you are getting, then you subtract taxation, the leftover, we call it disposable income. Right. So when you multiply now uh, the MPC times the disposable income, you get a new quantity that we are calling induced consumption. So in other words, if you look at the consumption function again, they're saying that C, consumption, is equal to CO plus C1 times YG. We can split this consumption into two parts. This is the first one. We can call it the autonomous, right, autonomous consumption. Then the last part, 
we call it induced consumption. So like I said, um, when you formulate a, a function or an equation, sometimes you want to have a visual idea of how the variables are related together. Right? You want to see how the variables are related together. So the best way of doing that is to draw those two functions in a two-dimensional system right so remember we have um, formulated the consumption function c is equals to uh, c0 plus c1 yd right. and then we have identified the two variables the first one is consumption so this is a variable which means it can change then the last one is disposable. Uh, I mean, it's uh, we call it disposable income. Yes, disposable income or ID. And then you can draw a graph that depicts visually the relationship between the two variables, C and YD. You want to see how these two depends on each other, right? And uh, to, to, to make this thing quite clear, when you look at variables, there are two types of variables. Right? So what I'm telling you a lot, guys, because I want you to understand things. Eh? I don't want you to just cram. Right? There are two types of variables. There's what is called a dependent variable. and a independent variable. These are the two variables that we have. It's either it's a dependent variable or it's an independent variable. Right? So this consumption function, it is showing us a relationship between the two variables, which are consumption and disposable income. Right? So which one is a dependent variable and which one is an independent variable between these two? Let me hear from uh, Zanelli. Zanelli, uh, are you there? I'm here. Are you, are you sleeping? No, <laughs> I'm not sleeping. All I'm right. trying to think. All right, yes, think. Okay. Um, Dependent, it means it depends on the other one. Independent, it means it doesn't depend on the other one. We've got two variables that we've identified, consumption and disposable income. Right? These are the two variables. Okay. So which one depends on the other? And which one doesn't depend on the other one? Um, I'd say YD is the dependent variable. Yes, yes that's correct. And, and the hence, C would be independent. Uh, okay, I think, okay, maybe I...